from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May God bless the hearing of this word for our understanding. Let's join together in prayer. O oh, gracious God, on this day when we remember the injustice of Jesus' death, we confess that we are caught up in the same injustices in our day. For your word from the book of Hebrews said that your sacrifice was to be the last sacrifice, and yet we continue to take the lives of those who are marginalized and oppressed. And we ask your forgiveness. On this day, when we remember your death, help us to commit ourselves to peace and to justice and to love that no other persons should unlawfully lose their lives. We ask, O oh Lord, that in this time of thinking of your death, we would also think of our own mortal lives and over the next couple days, contemplate them until we celebrate a new day. Open us to your spirit in this hour. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
Our first scripture reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he drew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Please join me in our prayer to confession. Crucified Christ, we confess that like your disciples, we have left you alone on the cross. Forgive us for our fickle faith and for our fatigue in failing to keep promises we made to you and to ourselves. Spare us from the full consequences of actions to alienate, isolate, and separate us from one another. Heal us by your cross, that it may be a bridge to you and across the barriers we have built between one another. Through Jesus, the one like us, and for us, we pray. Amen.
continue with Isaiah 53, picking up with verse 7 and continuing through verse 12. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain when you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressions. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Friends, believe the good news of God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John, chapter 19, verses 16b through 30. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because of the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. 
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fill the script, fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. A reading from the 12th chapter of John, verses 23 through 28. 
Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us, we pray, and grant us the peace only you can bring. Amen. We all have those moments in our life of discontinuity, of suffering, of crisis. For those among you who are pastors, who walk alongside people as caretakers, for all of us in Christ, it's a privilege and a harrowing responsibility to walk alongside one another in crisis. But we clergy were used to hearing a mother cry on the phone. We're at the hospital. A brother say something terrible has happened. Someone calling to say, can you come right away? So we leave and we arrive with empty hands and sorrowful hearts and no answers. We join their vigil, we find coffee and water, we offer our embrace and calm presence, we hope. We say a few words we found helpful in the past, we pray prayers together and we read the Psalms. And in those moments, we dare not offer reasons, reasons that from one hour to the next, a family story is forever changed, reasons some terror has visited. We have none. And there are things we know we won't say. We won't say this time of suffering is deserved. We won't suggest that the shooting, the car accident, the act of random violence, this deep sickness will serve some greater purpose yet to be revealed. Because we don't believe it's true. Suffering is not some bizarre and unwelcome gift from a whimsical or indifferent God. So it is appropriate that we end Lent where we began, face to face with death. One of the first things we ask in the face of these moments is, why? And that may be a question we're unable to live with. A better question may be, where? Where is God in the midst of our suffering and despair and death? Our suffering is not a divine tool God uses to draw us near. Instead, our suffering is the occasion God chooses to draw near to us. In Jesus, we see the face of God that we couldn't see before. 
and he comes to share our life and comes to deal with our suffering, our sin, with death and the seductive power of violence. But he will not ask to be snatched away from this terrible hour. It is precisely for this purpose that he has come to be with us, to bear the sin of the world, to lay down his life for the sheep of his flock and other folds. This is the meaning of his baptism when he took on to himself the sin of his people. It's the meaning of all his signs, all the healing, all the freeing, all the liberation. It's the meaning of Jesus' whole life, that the Father's glory may be shown in the loving obedience of the Son. And that alone is his prayer, that the Father's glory may be shown. This prayer characterizes his life, Father, hallowed be thy name. But we see him healing, restoring, freeing, connecting, and we see his entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The movement has begun. Everyone is finally knowing that the Messiah is here. God is here. God will save us. And we want it to keep growing and going. So it's a complete and horrifying surprise that Jesus has a radically different idea of love. Love that does not deliver its own from the power of death, but rather freely, voluntarily, completely offers himself to death. Must Jesus really die? And can we bear it? That we can't do this ourselves. We cannot cure our sin sickness. But we also can't bear the light of the world showing us all our shadows, our pretending, our wielding death and violence as if it would save us. In his death, he faces the ultimate enemy of creation, death. This is not divine pretending. Jesus faces death and drinks the cup of suffering down to the bitter dregs. Yet Jesus does something unanticipated. From the very place of violence, of danger, rejection, nailed to the cross, he loves and his love delivers us. While all around him fall to temptation, Jesus is faithful. Instead of pride, he shows utmost humility. Instead of shaming others, he treats all with dignity, even himself. Instead of succumbing to fear, he has courage. Instead of giving in to greed, he gives all of himself. And instead of lust, lustfully grabbing for power and control, he surrenders all to the Father. Instead of indulging hatred, Jesus will love, love, love until his very last breath. This is the glory of God. Love and oneness with God. And he takes his last breath and gives it to the Father. Only with his resurrection by the Spirit is his fate justified, and he is given victory over death and its agents. He is like a seed that is planted, and the tree that grows is now for the salvation of the whole world. But his victory is a victory in human flesh, not over it. We're not delivered from our vulnerability. We too will pass through death, 
but it's no longer an end for us. And we too are planted that new life may bloom. With Jesus' work on the cross, now human vulnerability is a blessing, not a curse. It is freedom, not bondage. Christ overcomes our isolation and despair, our rejection and our fear through his faith. Now we not, need not fear death or vulnerability. We need not run away from suffering in the world. We can walk right into the middle of it to love deeply without fear and surrender our lives in love. So back at the hospital bed, the accident site, the place of grief for a family who wonders where God might be during this time. The witness of Good Friday is we're able to affirm God is right here, weeping as we weep, hurting as we hurt. We may not have words, but we may lift a trembling finger toward our Lord on the tree. In the cross, God says a no to all the things that divide us from one another and from God. So let us not skip today. Let us not go straight to Easter praises. Today and tomorrow, feel the depth of your emotion, your need, our sinfulness. As the light of the world is snuffed out, the world in stillness awaits the resurrection.
reading from Luke, chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. John nineteen thirty. It is finished. The reading from Luke, chapter twenty three, verse forty six. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. May we join together into the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's good that Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Baptists and others, maybe, can join together in worship on this holy day. We do invite you, if you can stay a bit longer, lunch will be served downstairs in our fellowship hall. Uh, to get there, you can go through either door and hang around that way. Steps are down there. There's also an elevator that is straight behind in the hallway. Uh, you can also uh, get through, through a back stairwell out this way if it's too crowded this way. If you have to move on to other things for the day, you may find it easier just simply go out the front doors to the street if people get backed up on the steps. Remind you that um, Calvary Episcopal Church is opening their church sanctuary uh, this afternoon from noon until 3 uh, for you to have your own private meditation and prayer vigils. There are resources there to lead you in that time of prayer. And I encourage you to make access of that space just across the lawn uh, in the block um, that you may have your own private time of devotion and contemplating the events of this day so many years ago. Also remind you that a community sunrise service will be at the First Presbyterian Gardens um, at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning and if it's still raining in the sanctuary. And I've asked uh, Chipper Long to offer our grace. The lunch is already at the tables, so you can go straight down to the tables, and once you get seated, you may begin lunch. Uh, your lunch. We know that other people may have get back to work or other items today, so we want to make sure that's as quick as possible. And then after the blessing, then we'll have the benediction. Thank you. Let us go to God in prayer and bow our heads. Good and gracious God, bless these 
this food that we are about to receive through thy bounty. Bless the hands who have prepared it. Bless the earth that has offered it. Bless the bodies that will receive it all to the glory of thy name so that we may do your work in your name only. Amen. Now may you stand all together for the benediction. Friends, as you go back out into the world, persevere in prayer. Overcome evil with good. And love your enemies until they become friends. And together we may join the Holy Spirit in God's transformation of the world until we are all resurrected with Christ. And now may God the Father Guard your ways, and wherever you go this next week, may Jesus the Christ walk beside you, and may the Holy Spirit surround you and protect you. Go in peace. Amen.